Hey, hey, everybody, what's up? It's your boy, MJ. Welcome to 20 Questions with MJ Before the Poor. My guest today is master of wine, wine educator, columnist, and co-author of the iconic book, Wine for Dummies, Mary Ewing Mulligan. Mary was the first woman in North America, that means Canada and the US for you people who fail geography, to become a master of wine, a title that represents the highest level of knowledge and proficiency in the wine trade. She is currently one of only 57 masters of wine in the US and 417 in the world. Uh, she is president of the International Wine Center in New York City, an independent wine and spirit school founded in 1982. At the IWC, Mary runs the academically rigorous programs of the Wine and Spirit Education Trust for all you Wisset ones and twos out there. This is your mother. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the world's most, it's the world's largest wine education organization. And this is before the poor. You guys know, even during the show, I will make myself and my guests laugh and we don't care. We don't edit. We have to save money. Um, she has co-authored with her husband, Ed McCarthy, Wine for Dummies. Uh, I think it's on the seventh edition now, and also 10 other wine books in the Four Dummies series. Uh, with well over 1 million copies sold since it was published in late 1995, and translations into 38 languages, Wine for Dummies ranks as America's fastest selling wine book ever. Welcome, Mary. Is there anything you'd like to add? I would just like to say how great it is to be here, MJ. Really great. And you made me laugh already. Okay, good. <laughs> so I just want to warm up a little bit, right? And so to do that, I'm going to start by asking you uh, some personal questions. They're actually not that personal. And then I'm going to follow those with uh, James, Lipton's, James Lipton's famous questions from inside the actor's studio. All right? But the key to this is just answer them quickly. First thing that comes to your head, okay? Okay. All right. What is your favorite book? <laughs> Already, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, once upon a time, I said that my favorite book was The Once and Future King by uh, T.H. White. That was quite a long while ago, but it is, uh, it is the story of uh, Merlin. Oh, wow. The story of Merlin, not the story of, yep. of mm -hmm. uh, King Arthur. And uh, so once upon a time, it was that. At the moment, I can't tell you. Okay. I like that. Uh, Merlin's backstory. I love it. Um, what is your favorite movie? Oh, not my favorite movie, but the movie that I've just been thinking about lately because it's it's reached an anniversary is um, the one with John Voight and Dustin Hoffman, Midnight Cowboy. Midnight, Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. I was just I was I was just reading a lot about that. There's a book out about it, and I dearly love that movie. And uh, I'm thinking maybe I'll see it again. Very cool. I need to see it. I, I think I saw that when I was little and didn't even understand it. I need to watch it now. Okay. Who is your favorite musical artist? Ooh. Springsteen, Van Morrison, The Eagles, um, The Beatles, Once Upon a Time. She's got I, the classic rock playlist yeah, going on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very nice. Um, yeah, someone else. Oh, last guest was also Springsteen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, death row, last meal. What's your favorite food? I would, I would probably go for some kind of steak. Not that I eat steak that often, <laughs> but there is something really sensual about it. If it's well cooked and melts in your mouth, of course, that's not what you would get on death row. But uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, I think that. I, I would probably go for that because I can imagine myself just savoring every bite. And, of course, it would go well with red wine. Of course. So I imagine they have that, right? They, You know, it's your last meal. What, what red wine would you say? <laughs> now it's a two-part question. What red wine would you have with that? Uh, I would have uh, probably a Cabernet-based uh, Bordeaux, so something from the left bank. Okay. Excellent. See, all you young people have said, an Argentinian Malbec, which would not be wrong. Oh, I love Malbec. It wouldn't be wrong. It yeah. wouldn't be wrong, but, you know. Um, who is your favorite athlete? Barry Bonds. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Who was your favorite cartoon character as a child? 
I, I can't think of a one to tell you the truth. <laughs> it was too long I was ago. Like, I was like, I don't Mary, wanna... you know they got car <laughs> <They're> <laughs> cartoons forever. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it, you know, the audience can't see me, and I don't think I look old, but uh, it has been a long, long time since <laughs> I've watched cartoons. So, because I don't watch The Simpsons, so okay. uh, so I can't say that. So okay. I don't. Know. Fair enough. Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill. <laughs> oh no, Mr. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, what was your favorite cereal? Cereal. It was um, rice checks. Nice. With no added sugar. No added sugar. Okay. Um, this one came out of when we started. We were in a full-on lockdown. What's your current exercise routine? Yoga. Yoga. I do Ashtanga yoga, and I used to practice it an hour a day, but my studio closed during the COVID, and it's probably not going to reopen, mm -hmm. and um, now I just do it in my living room. And life being pressured as it is these days, I'm down to... Half an hour a day. And that's not the direction you're supposed to go in down. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I'm half an hour a day. Okay, excellent. And, I, you know, I tell people, because I'm kind of into wine and wellness, like, if you can do something, what can you do, right? So yeah. you maybe, you know, studio's closed, but, but you're still doing a half hour, and yeah. I think that helps. Well, you know, I used to be a runner, and I ran three marathons, and I trained for another two that at the last minute I couldn't run because I had a fever the day before, so I said I better not. And, oh, my goodness, I really, really, really loved running. As long as I could have earphones and music. And uh, I, I, uh, God, loved it, loved oh, it. Awesome. But, you know, there comes a time when you can't do it anymore. Yes. It's just too hard on you. Yeah, I, I ran. Or, I ran in high school and college for a little bit, and I, don't, I, I miss running. But everybody I know who ran are still having injuries. Yeah. Over, you know, it's just a tough one. Yeah. So I agree. Um, who's your favorite comedian? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not thinking of it, of the right names today. Uh, the uh, <laughs> Colbert. Oh, Steve Colbert. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to uh, conjure up his name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who would you most like to have a bottle of wine with? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, back in the uh, turn of the century, there were uh, lots of uh, questionnaires that went around and um, uh, various publications were, were, were asking a lot of people this, and so many people said Thomas Jefferson, you know. And my answer is, is rather obscure, except to wine people. It was Emile Peynot, who was a professor at the University of Bordeaux, and he was a consulting winemaker in Bordeaux in the um, late 70s, early 80s, I guess all through the 80s. Or, or maybe Paul Pantelier, who was winemaker at, at, at Chateau Margaux, who who died way too young. Uh, uh, it it would be Paul Pantelier. Great. That's <coughs> that could be the best answer we've had for that question. Is it a competition? No, I mean, it's, yeah, isn't it? I mean, you know, <laughs> we were talking about it's turning into like people. Some people are showing like four bottles. If you were coming, like so. <laughs> no, it's just funny. Like you, I think you're the first person who said somebody inside of wine is why mm -hmm. it was a good answer. I mean, it, they, they were all great answers, but like it was like Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, which I'm sure you know, LeBron James. But that was a that was a fascinating answer. Well, you see, you're already off my list because I am going to have a bottle of wine with you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, this is this for just so you guys, I am a little fanboy in here because we're going to get into her book during the. Show, but anyway, okay, we got 10 more questions and we're gonna get going. Okay, so now we're going to uh, switch to inside the actor's studio. So I'll ask one question in this voice and then I'll go back to talking like this. <laughs> what is your favorite word? I love words. Do I have a favorite word? I do have, a, I do have many favorite words. Um, I know these are tough questions, right? Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. What did uh, what did some famous actress say? I'll take her word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your least favorite word? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't get enough sleep last night. <laughs> okay, so... Um, 
All right, just, we're, I'm gonna throw you a, a softball. Okay. What turns you on? Language. Very nice. Turns her on so much she can't think of her favorite word or least no, favorite word. No, no, <laughs> no, I know, I, I get it. Like it's like it's, it's overload. <laughs> what turns you off? Oh, pretentiousness. And that might be why you wrote a book called Wine for Dummies. Mm. <laughs> Um, what sound or noise do you love? Silence. Mm. The sound of silence. It has a sound. It does. I was giving us some there. Yeah, did you guys, did you guys catch that? <laughs> 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 what sound or noise do you hate? Motorcycles running in unison down 8th Avenue in Harlem. <laughs> I, oh. I'm right there with you. I can't stand the Harley Davidson gangs when they just come. Oh, it's so loud. And the mufflers, the Whistler mufflers. I hate those too. Anyway. Um, okay. What's your favorite curse word? Dang. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I always believed I would have made a good lawyer. And um, I think, I mean, at, I'm not going to become a lawyer, but I do, because it's, it's language too, you know, yes, the law. Right. I mm -hmm. mean, you have, to, you have to understand what every word means, and then you can interpret what this law is trying to say. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, what profession would you not like to do? Oh, I would not like to wait tables. I would not like to be on my feet all day. I would not like to do anything in which I had to uh, show off to other people or convince other people of who I am or what I know. So I, I was briefly in my early wine career working half-time in fashion and half-time in wine. And I passed up an opportunity for a big promotion in fashion because I just didn't like the people in the fashion world. And apologies to all you people in the fashion world who <laughs> listen to wine podcasts. Uh, I don't mean you, but uh, I just, uh, uh, they were superior. And um, I would not like to be in a profession where I have to be superior. Got it. Got it. And then lastly, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well enough done. Well, there you go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is always fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. If you want more, Mary, and I know you do, tune into our episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. Until then, cheers. Hey, hey, everybody, what's up? It's your boy, MJ. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is master of wine, wine educator, columnist, and co-author of the iconic book, Wine for Dummies, Mary Ewing Mulligan. Uh, Mary was the first woman in North America to become a master of wine. That is a title that represents the highest level of knowledge and proficiency in the wine trade. She is currently one of only 57 Masters of Wine in the U.S. and 417 in the world. She is president of the International Wine Center in New York City. It's an independent wine and spirits school founded in 1982. And at the IWC, Mary runs the academically rigorous programs of the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, WISET, which is the world's largest wine education organization. And I know all you little Instagrammers out there with your WITSET ones are so excited and Hope you really know who this woman is, by the way. <laughs> um, she has co-authored with her husband, Ed McCarthy, Wine for Dummies, the seventh edition they're on now, and she's also penned 10 other wine books in the Four Dummies series, uh, with well over 1 million copies sold since it was published in 1995, and translations into 38 languages. Wine for Dummies ranks as America's fastest selling wine book ever. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. Mary, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, that was great. That was more than enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. So 
You guys, Mary and I connected through Instagram. Uh, somehow she started following me and you know the show was going on and I was like, and we'll get into this. You guys, if you've listened to me talk about, if you've heard me on other shows, how much I love this book, Wine for Dummies. So I said, you know what? Let me send her a DM. And and then nothing happened for like six weeks. And then I got this really nice message like, oh, my God, I didn't see this. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I would love to. So here we are. So uh, Mary, tell everybody what we're drinking tonight. What would you bring? So I brought a uh, rosé from Corsica. It is uh, – so – I, I am not an expert on Corsican wines, uh, but uh, I happen to have it at home. My husband bought a couple of bottles. He's he's our house sommelier, and uh, he bought a few bottles of this, and we had one the other night. And I was looking for something interesting, you know, and I thought that – and different, you know. something. I wanted to be sure no one else had brought the same wine ever <laughs> or ever again. So I, I brought this wine. So it's called Clo Alivu. And it is a uh, a rosé uh, from the Patrimonio region of uh, of Corsica. And once I had a Patrimonio, it was something that Kermit Lynch brought in, that was a red uh, Patrimonio. And I still have the bottle. It's like four or five years later, I still have the bottle in my kitchen. It was one of the greatest wines I ever had. And we have wow. one more bottle of it. It was called Memoria. So uh, when I saw Patrimonio, I thought, well, this is interesting, you know. So this is a wine region in uh, Corsica, and this is made from the uh, Nialuccio grape, which is another name for Sangiovese. Oh, right, 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 right. So we have a rosé of Nialucci? Nialuccio. Nialuccio. I'm just going to say Sangiovese. Sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to butcher that. But, um, yes, uh, Corsican wines. Um, I'm excited. I don't get to drink much stuff from Corsica, um, and I I do know I'm like I'm not an expert, but because of where it's located, I know it has a rich history of growing wine, you know, and uh, so super excited. So um, let's get that going, um, and I'll get open in that in a second. But before we get into the many accomplishments you've had, um, if you've listened to the show, there's no black wine guy experience without. Acker Wines and Wine for Dummies. Um, when I started working at Acker, you probably know, you probably know Ron Capon. Uncle, oh, Uncle Ron. Ron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's quite a character, exactly. Uh, he's like, he's like, uh, read Wine for Dummies. It's a great book. And so I got it, and it, it's my it, to this day, it's my Bible. Like, there's the there's Kevin's book, there's Women in the World, and, and like there's a plethora of other books out there now. This is my copy. I might even ask her to sign it. <laughs> But like it, every, it, everything in there, like like even today, uh, Mary brought glasses. There's there's a chapter in there on glasses. And and kids, this was written in nineteen. Uh, it was released in late nineteen ninety five, right? So, with you know, loves auto glass, but all these new glasses. This is this is not. There's nothing new under the wine sun, kids. That's why we have Mary here. We're going to school today. <laughs> Professor Ewing Mulligan is is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, tell tell I'm an open wine. Tell us why you brought the wine glasses. Interesting enough. Well, uh, actually, uh, when Ed, my husband, opened up this wine, I was uh, finishing up a bottle of red wine, and he opened up this for himself. We often eat separate meals just because of of we each choose to eat different kinds of things, and uh, so he wanted a whiter rosé. So he had his, and he had that, and he opened it, and uh, he put it into a wide uh, glass, like a uh, short white burgundy globe glass. It's, he, it's one of his favorite glasses, and it's great for white wines. And sometimes I have been astounded how good the wines taste in that glass. Uh, but when I put this wine in that glass, I said, eh. And I often get an instinct when I taste a wine. I said, well, wait a minute. Let me just try it in this other glass. And I put it in an other glass, and suddenly I like it so much more. And I can't explain it. It's I, I wish I was a physicist or something, and then I could explain how the 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 physics of the wine in the glass shape and the and the uh, wine in the shape of your mouth, uh, how that all works. I I I can't. I don't. But uh, Wines 
taste can taste I, I've shocked so many people. When the wine is right and the glass is wrong and you put it in another glass, people say, I can't believe it. But it's so different. It's so different. And I just l love the – well, it opens up a, a hornet's nest, honestly, of so what does this wine really taste like, And um, it, which is a fascinating topic. And I think that just by – taking the same wine and putting it into two different glasses, you can begin to broach that topic. So before, <clears throat> before, before the pour, which we, we should just start rolling when people come in because we lose so many good things. But you were, you're even saying how when you think about that, if you think about uh, someone who's a critic or who scores wines and they're at a tasting, <clears throat> first of all, what, what glass are they using? Um, I know when you go to a trade tasting, you get one glass and you try and rinse it out with the, the next wine and, and but whatever. But literally, it, you just like have blown. You've turned wine scores into like Swiss cheese if you really think about like what glass, what day, how long was. I mean, there's so many factors that go into a wine. The temperature of temperature, the wine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it's mind boggling. That being said, we know that for Mary's palate, this was the best glass of Venus wine, so I'm, I'm just going to roll with that. But if, you know, it might be interesting to taste it in another glass for yeah. comparison. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so it smells great, nice and minerally. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the book, Wine for Dummies, love the book. Um, but I understand that you grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, was your family into food and wine? No. Or, or antiquing? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I wasn't in that part of Bucks County. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was in Lower Bucks County. Okay. But I, I say Bucks County because it leaves it to your imagination what of part course. of Bucks County. That's why I tell people I went to school in New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say where I went. <laughs> Where'd you school? New Haven. Yeah. Right. right exactly. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, I was closer to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, no, mm, not at all. My mother, uh, my mother's parents were from Ireland. And uh, as a result, she couldn't cook. And again, apologies to all you Irish people out there. Uh, I'm sure it's different now. I mean, now you can go to Ireland and you can get fabulous cooking. But in those days, it was, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, skill or art to uh, cooking by Irish people, at least in my family. And um, uh, no, my father uh, preferred bourbon to wine. So no, never any wine, never, never. Wow, wow, wow. Um, so you went to uh, UPenn, mm -hmm. got a degree in English. Did you start in learning about wine there? Cause, I mean, because you think of the Ivy League, we all think of the Ivy League, and like, you think of, uh, so, uh, what are those? Blazers with suede patches and people swilling, sh uh, you know, sherry or, or cognac and this was having Bordeaux and Burgundy. This was the 70s. <laughs> okay. Everything was being upended. <laughs> I remember how liberating it was to go to class wearing a sweatshirt and jeans. And oh, suddenly, wow. And suddenly I realized I didn't have to look and see what other people were wearing and nobody's looking to see what I'm wearing. I could just focus on the lesson, you know? Yeah. So it was those days. But uh, no, I got out of school, and my first husband was uh, in law school, and I needed to uh, get a job, basically. It was an imperative. Somebody had to make some money. And uh, so I got, uh, I started interviewing through the placement office, and I uh, landed a job at the Italian Trade Commission in Philadelphia. And I'm not Italian. I didn't speak Italian at the time. I, um, basically the job, in retrospect, I know what to call the job. I didn't know what to call it then. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a PR generalist. So I was promoting Italian-made products of all sorts, and that was giftware and machine tools and printing machinery and fashion and wine and, and food and anything that, that Italy makes. And uh, they needed someone who could handle the English, I mean, literally, rather than they, they had an office full of Italian speakers, and they needed <laughs> an, a native English speaker. So uh, I just discovered wine through that, and it was really the most exciting thing that I covered, and I was able to 
turned my job more and more and more into a job about wine, about Italian wines. And I learned so much just from the importers in, in that day who were standing behind tables at tastings and letting me taste things and teaching me, you know, there was no formal education at all. And uh, it, it was just, I was so fascinated by wine. And I think one of the things that has always fascinated me about wine is that you can never learn everything there is to know about wine. Yep. And even if today I could know every single thing that there is to know about wine, which is not possible, but even if, come the next vintage, everything is different. So it, you, you can't, it doesn't stop. Yeah, yeah. That's what attracted me to wine too, was like, oh my God, I could never know this. This is awesome. <laughs> like it really is, because you, you wake up hungry, right? You wake up and you have something to, to strive for versus other fields where, you, you know, there's always evolving knowledge, but you know, like lawyers know everything till they lose a case, but it's pretty much, it's written, right? Like doctors, new, new things happen, but like what wine, like you said, just the vintage from vintage to vintage is different. And something you said earlier, I, um, like your writing, like how you were able to take, you, you, you were able to, you had that English degree, so you were kind of doing PR for them, and then you were, you, you kind of let, fell like to go towards the wine you started learning there so what was like like was there a wine job writing writing job that came after that or like what was the, the no progression? no after that actually i went into the uh hard uh business end of wine and i was an agent for a couple of italian wineries for three years and uh you know you learn from your failures and I discovered that I hate sales. I should have answered that in the 20 questions. I should have said that uh, <laughs> what I would hate to do more than anything is sales. But anyway, uh, and then I went and I worked for uh, PepsiCo, um, which had a wine and spirits division. I was doing PR there. And then, but that was outside the city. And I really, really wanted to get back into the city and the wine scene in the city. So I ended up at International Wine Center. So, um, how many like, like how many female women were working in the business side of wine when you were doing that too? That had to be. You know, I wasn't on the business end myself. Or the sales well, side. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, uh, back the many years that I was with the Italian Trade Commission and learning about wine, it was totally all guys that were teaching me. Mm -hmm. It was the son of the of the Italian immigrant who started this wine importing company. And it was, you know, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were no women. Um, I, I, never, I never felt disadvantaged being a woman in wine. Um, of course, I was in my 20s. I mean, who, who doesn't, you know, what doors don't open to a young woman in her 20s, you know, who's eager and hardworking, and and uh, the fact that I was female didn't seem to stop me at all in the wine business, and I was really driven to make my way in, in the business world, um, very much a, a feminist, a mm -hmm. women's liber, mm -hmm. marching for the Equal Rights Amendment and all that kind of thing. So uh, I, uh, whether there were women around me or not, I hardly remember, but it didn't matter to me. Yeah, no, I... I, I ask people that question sometimes because i i'd say like like the black wine guy comes out of i was like only black guy in a lot of wine tastings but like i want to learn about wine i wasn't worried about who else was in the room per se and i think i think that as doors open and we need doors open we need diversity i think the people who understand the people who come through the door first are focused on being the best at in the business and it's not so much about i'm breaking ground for everybody it's just oh, literally yeah. having the focus to you know, like whether you want to be a female director or whatever, like you have to have the focus to to do the right things, to to uh, move forward. So I like what you said. Like, and obviously, you're when when you talk about going to Penn, I was like, oh right, she went to college and like they were burning their bras and like they were like that whole you know like you didn't have to wear your skirt anymore. Like so like you that's who you are, and yet you just loved wine, so you put your head down and went to work, right? You know, even when I I became a master of wine. Um, the the first year there were six of us that went over to London to sit the exam. It was the very first year that it was open to Americans was 1989, and two of the six of us were female. And um, 
that didn't mean anything to me here nor there. And five years later, because I, I passed the, there are two parts to the exam, and I passed the theory part, um, my second attempt, which was when the first two Americans, both guys, uh, became masters of wine. And I passed the theory part, which is considered the hard part, but I had to make quite a few more attempts. So three years on the tasting, so three years later I passed the tasting. And uh, so I was not the first uh, American, I was not the second, I was not the third American, you know. Um, I was the first in New York City, but I was the first female. And um, it was a publicity point. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, I, a friend who was a publicist put out a press release about me, but uh, I didn't bring up the female thing, but the writers did. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's that's how that came about. Yeah, yeah. And at that time, <clears throat> um, so the, how many how many um, women were masters of wines back then, just worldwide? Even it still had to be a relatively small number, right? I don't know, and okay. w and we don't, and we've never kept statistics that way. Mm -hmm. Nor do we keep statistics by nationality, but more like your country of residence. Got okay, it. so a, a, an English guy living here counts as one of the North American masters of wine. But anyway, um, but there were not very many. Um, Jancis Robinson was, uh, she was not the first, but she was early on, and she was the first person who was not actually in the wine trade. The wine trade in the UK basically means sales. Okay. Im importing and sales, okay. you know. Um, and uh, she was not in the wine trade. She was a journalist. And she was the first non-wine trade person to become an MW. Serena Sutcliffe was there uh, probably before her and uh, a few women. But by the time I came along, I mean, there were there were more. And now I think every year more women pass than men. Sure feels like it. Yeah, yeah. I, we're, we're better students. Uh, I, and, and I think better have better palates, to be honest. But, yeah. I, I'm a guy. I just have to admit. I, I think I think you're able to just make some distinctions that uh, that our lazy male tongues <laughs> could gloss over. You know, I don't know what it is, but I, I have found that I found I find women to be very very strong. The, you know, the only thing that I, I uh, that comes to mind when people uh, ask me, do I think that women are better tasters, uh, is that on an archetypal level the female of the species has a lot of reason to have a more sensitive sense of smell. Is the food burning? Is the house burning down? Is my baby's diaper poopy? I was like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, no, there, there, ha there would be a reason. You're absolutely right. Um, um, that's really cool, though. I like what you said. Like, it just... It's 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 done by where you live. It's not done like I, like some of the standards that they're just uh, kind of. Did you do the work, right? Yeah. You know, did you do the work? So you said you uh, wanted to be back in the city, so you landed at IWC. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Nineteen eighty four. Okay. Okay. So that was already in existence, I take it? It was in existence for two years. And as a matter of fact, I was uh, there was a wine club there, and um, Ed and I were both members of the wine club there. So I, I knew it well. And once I was coming, I remember walking up the stairs, the flight of stairs, carrying uh, a case of, uh, of Rioja that um, Monsieur Henri imported. And I was carrying it up uh, for a tasting that I was going to deliver there in my capacity of doing public relations for this brand and uh, somebody uh, one of the other members or something saw me carrying this uh, case of wine up and said oh so you got the job huh <laughs> <laughs> and I said no I'm this but but then I, I did get the job and uh, yes it is a lot of carrying cases of wine and and things like that you know and a lot of uh, grunt work like being a cellar rat anywhere right, right. but uh, it was it, it was terrific and uh, um, International Wine Center has its various uh, moments since then, different, various faces, diff different locations, et cetera. But now it is, you know, uh, here to stay as a WSET school. You, you said WSET. Yeah. 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 yeah well, we said WSET. Okay. I know. Yeah. I, I'm from Jersey. What can I tell you? Well, at least you say, don't say WSET. That's, that's <laughs> something that I particularly dislike. 
<laughs> no W set. It's W S E T, people. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, how, how'd you advance through the ranks here to become president? Uh, the school. So, I was just telling someone uh, about this this morning on a, a um, someone from overseas. Uh, the it was in the mid '80s, and there was a restaurant attached to the school called Tastings Restaurant. It was one of the first wine bars in the city. Uh, big, huge Cruvenet, two Cruvenets, one for white wines, one for red wines. Uh, very exciting. And um, it, it was just in that period when the whole restaurant scene was changing. So two things in particular were changing for restaurant owners. One, um, liability insurance, specifically liquor liability insurance, was going from maybe $4,000 a year to $4,000 a month, oh. something like that. But there was a huge increase in the amount of the, you know, the, 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 the what the, the insurance companies were charging. And uh, the other thing was the celebrity chef period. So that if you used to get a chef for it, I have no idea what the salaries were, uh, but let's say you had a chef for 35,000 a year or something, and suddenly you needed to pay a chef 85,000 to get a good enough chef, you know, let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the salaries for chefs. And, and this was changing the whole financial um, challenge of running a restaurant. I was not part of that. I, um, the founder, Al Hotchkin, um, was part of that. But I, you know, I heard about some mm -hmm. of this from him. From him, And uh, he decided he was going to uh, sell the restaurant, get out of the restaurant business, um, sell the lease on the building. The building would be demolished, and it was demolished. It was opposite city center on um, West 55th Street. Okay. It was an old little carriage house, really darling, and uh, it was demolished. And um, he went off and opened uh, a wine shop called Burgundy Wine Company. I've heard of that one. Yeah. He's <laughs> Unfortunately, he passed away too young mm. to, you know, that's a pity. Uh, but... Uh, I became his partner because I wanted to keep the wine school open, kind of like part-time after hours. We'll find different locations to do some tastings and things like that. And as a result of that, he said, yes, well, why don't you come into the business? And so I did, and we were partners in the business until about uh, 97, 98, and then um, I took over the business from him. Okay. And... Why was that so important to you to <clears throat> keep the uh, wine school going? You know, I, I got a, a notice um, of, uh, you know, you know I'm, I got a, a pink slip like everybody else mm -hmm. in the restaurant and in the school. And so I said, oh, God, what do I do now? Because I really like this. And uh, I thought about, you know, I needed a day job. What am I going to do for a day job? I thought, what can I do? What can I do here? What can I do there? What can I do? I go to another wine company, and I could, in the city though, and be PR and do that. You know, it it wasn't appealing to me too much, but I figured, well, I'll find something. But I, I, I think it was the learning. I I think it was just that. You know, they say if you want to learn about something, teach. Mm -hmm. And I was not. I was a teacher. I was not the only teacher. I had never had any formal wine education, and I just loved the exposure to wine, the free ranging. I mean, we had. Angela Gaia was one of the first people that came to the wine club. Pierre Antonori came to the wine club. We had La Lubis La Voix come. Mm -hmm. We had, um, I mean, producers small and, and great and, and famous and infamous <laughs> 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 come. And uh, uh, it was just such a rich, rich learning experience and in the company of other people who love wine. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that was something very special that needed to be kept going so uh i kept it going that is that's like legends that's just amazing and when you said um you want to keep the education going it just had me go back to uh preparing for your master of wine um you know like did you have a study group like how like how like you know, like you know, they they made movies about people in study groups and date. Like, like, mm -hmm. like, what was it like? What was it like? I mean, you just had to find wines and oh, you, someone to work with you, like if you could. You know, uh, there. So, 
until 1988, Master of Wine was not a goal for Americans. You had to hold the WCT diploma. To hold the WCT diploma, you had to be working in the wine trade in the UK. So, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it, it was kind British. of limiting. <laughs> And so uh, I, I know one woman who actually left New York and moved to the UK because she wanted to become a master okay. of wine. Uh, she wanted to take the WCT diploma so she could become a master of wine. Uh, so until 1988, um, it it wasn't even, I mean, Clive Coates would come, uh, Serena Sutcliffe came and spoke to our wine club, but it wasn't even an aspiration. It was just like, Maybe wouldn't it be nice if, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I could scale tall buildings <laughs> in a single bound, you know? I, so I, uh, then suddenly, uh, it was in October of 88, and the Masters of Wine came over, and they held a, uh, a luncheon for invited guests in the pool room of the Four Seasons Hotel and uh, outlined a process whereby, by writing an essay, taking a tasting test, we could apply to take the exam, to take the exam. No study course, no mentors or anything. So I just, um, <laughs> I said, I said, I have to do it. I said to my husband, you have to do it. I said to Al Hashkin, you have to do it. <laughs> I mean, I just thought, like, oh, you have to do this. I mean, how could anybody not do this? And, and I got in, and uh, so that, I found out I got in. I, I remember it was on March 3rd, because it was the day before my birthday, and I found out on March 3rd that I could come to London to sit the exam on May 6th. So That's two <laughs> months. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I could, I could never have done it if I didn't have the background that I already had from, and the, and the curiosity and, and, and the, the, the passion for wine that gives you the curiosity, the questioning mm. mind to always be asking questions. Well, if this is true here, isn't it true there, too? Oh, no, no, because, you see, they've got the mountain breezes. Oh, okay, so that makes the, okay, you know, right. and understanding how it all works, how the grapes work, how the wine works, et cetera. And uh, so I had that background. I was still ill-prepared for it. So that was when I read uh, this book, Knowing and Making Wine, by Emile Peno. Okay. And I read it four times uh, before I uh uh, pass the exam the following the theory part of the exam the following year it is the most earmarked um, annotated book that I have it is so precious to me and uh, I just um, I had to learn on my own basically I had to learn on my own and then the great the great good karma of it all was that after I became a master of wine in 93 I had been trying to get the WSET courses. They were in, in Toronto, but they were not in the U.S. at all. And I was trying to get them into the U.S. And the miraculous thing was that the people from WSET approached me when I was in London to do my acceptance for the Master of Wine. And they said, you know, we, we know you've been contacting us, and we think we'd like to start talking to you. And uh, in 1994, I started offering the programs in the U.S. And it's completely different because it's structured. So I just want to say two more things at the risk of, of sounding um, truly um, Flintstone era. Um, when I was studying, uh, there was no Oxford Companion to Wine, mm -hmm. okay? When I was studying, there was no internet, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So it was truly printed books. There was email, mm -hmm. just beginning. Yeah, but that was like, I was I was in grad school and I wasn't even using email. It was like email was still just like it was like ninety. I was still in law school. I was like, what's this email? <laughs> we were we had faxes. Yeah. We were sending yeah, faxes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes <laughs> telexes. You know. <laughs> wow. How did you? How did you? How did you pass with no Oxford <laughs> Companion of Wine? How did you pass with like no organization that pair you with a mentor? Well, uh, eventually, in, in 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 you know, so in by my third and fourth year in the program, I I did have a mentor, but I was only doing the tasting at that time, mm -hmm. so the mentor was of less value. 
I, you know, it's so funny how uh, some of our conversation today is coming around. You know, I um, I love words. I like, and and this could carry us back to wine for dummies, for that matter. I I love language, and I I think, and communication is is seriously important. Uh, and good communication requires you to be literal. So. I would look at a question on the exam, and I would look at it very, very carefully, and I would figure out the potential with when, with what, within, within it, the potential within it. So if it says, uh, how do something about wine producers and uh, consumers, you know, and and something maybe posing a question along with the relationship of wine uh, producers and consumers and or customers and i would realize that wine producers could be all over the world they could be huge co-ops they could be huge industrial mm. uh operations they could be small mom and pop you know family uh, operations they could be anywhere in the world and the wine that they're making could be white red sparkling rosé or fortified so all sorts of different universe captured within the word wine and and the customers could be trade customers like retailers or restaurateurs. They could be trade customers like an importer in another country who purchases your wine for the purpose of reselling it, or the customer could be the end user. And so just looking at the words, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going on. No, you'd have been a, you'd have been a damn good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just like, just like brainstorming all the words, right. I would come up with an answer that m- might not be exactly the, I mean, there's never one answer that they're looking for. But it absolutely would address the question in an original way, and I think that's how I passed. That's really cool. Um, let's just take a break right there, quick break. Um, I want to come back, talk some more about WSET, and then WINE for the dummy like me. So we'll be right back, everybody. Okay, we're back. So, um, you were breaking down words, <laughs> 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 and um, and how um, earlier, just before that, how you how you studied to pass your exam. Um, so, was that kind of the impetus for what what gave you the idea to write a for dummies book on wine? I wanted to write a book. I had three different ideas for writing uh, a wine book. Um, and um, I, so Wine for Dummies, it was the very beginning of the Dummy series, and most of the Dummies books at that time were computer books, all right? Um, I'm, das- I'm just, I'll tell you, it's so funny. I had that on a train in 1998 and some woman's like i'm a dummy too she thought it was win e she thought it was a different programming language she like right because they were all about dos and, and microsoft where she thought it was like what's win e <laughs> so go ahead so yeah so uh one so uh, one day and I, I was already a master one at this at this time and i belonged to a computer a mac computer um book of the month club and you know they would uh, send you a postcard and you had to return the postcard if you did not want to receive this month's selection and i would always forget to say i don't want to receive it and it would come in and my husband because he was retired from teaching at the time or or nearly um i would say oh could you just take this to the post office and return it you know before without opening it you know and uh, so finally, uh, once we got a package, and he said, is this another book that you didn't order? And I, I saw what it was. It was Max for Dummies. And, and, and I was proficient in Macintosh, but he wasn't. So I said, no, no, darling. I ordered it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, I was uh, the one thing that was tricky with early Max was uh, fonts and font suitcases. You had to have an Adobe font suitcase. And... And uh, so I took it on the train one Saturday. I was going into my wine school. And I remember, I remember that moment like, like it could have been the moment that I met my husband or something, but I remember just exactly where I was, where I was sitting on the train, the sun coming through the window. And I started, uh, I, I went to the index of Max for Dummies and started reading about fonts. 
And I got to this point where David Pogue, who was the uh, the author, he was talking about um, the Adobe. He was giving everyone the inside scoop on the the turf war between Adobe and Apple. I said, this is great. This is great. Somebody has to do for wine what he's doing for computers. I mean, I just I just love the idea of, of being able to take people and bring them inside, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I proposed it to an agent, and he said, eh. And he never, he, he hardly knew. He was a traditional, he was an ex-Simon & Schuster agent. And he says, oh, intro books don't sell. <laughs> and and then once, it just a, a serendipity, I got a phone call from a, a guy who uh, was looking, who became our agent, and he was looking for someone to ghostwrite a book in a, um, a self, a book about wine in a self-help series. And I remember that moment, like time stopped, and I'm thinking like, well, what do I say? I don't want to reveal my secret. Um, I don't want to say wine for dummies. I'll say, does your self-help series have bright yellow covers? This is what I'll say, you know? Right. And uh, I'm thinking this, and, and then he pops in. He says, you know the, the Four Dummies series? And I said, well, that's my book. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just around the time of the movie Working Women in which Melanie Griffith yep. has to prove ownership of her own idea. So I had to, I felt I had to prove to him. I said, Max for Dummies, David Pope. I was on the train. This, <laughs> you know, and, and, and yeah. And uh, so uh, Ed and I ended up writing the book. Oh, and it was fantastic. We we wrote the whole book in like three months, and, I, and I, we joke and we say, it took us three months, but twenty five years mm-hmm. of wine experience between us. But it took us three months to actually write the book. And um, how was it received when it first hit the market? Fantastic. It was nominated for a James Beard Award. Of course, it didn't get it because there's this word "dummies" in the title. You know, um, the first translation, believe it or not, was in French which floored us because we, I mean, we know that the French need to know about the wines of the world more than they did at the time because they basically knew their own wines and right. their own local wines. Right. But we were floored that the French would would welcome such a thing. And uh, the last uh, translation that I remember, which also floored us, was in Turkish. Huh. Yeah. So... That's just, wow, I'm blown away by a number of things. One, James Beard, because as when, you're as saying, I'm like, I'm pretty sure a wine book that has a word that rhymes with jolly in it won an award a couple of years ago. <laughs> okay, right. Um, but, I mean, that's just a progression. Like, there was no way there was, like, it was too, so James Beard, we will not have any dummies. <laughs> You know, it's uh, uh, the 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 whole name of the dummy series is obviously ironic, uh, and uh, uh, if you don't know a topic or you want to know more about the top a topic, you you can very easily admit, oh, I'm a dummy when it comes to that topic. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, if you think you know a topic and you know that the wine business is full of people who think that they know everything about wine. Um, and I'll be the first to say I do not know everything about wine. Uh, they will take offense. Yeah, no, I I agree. I'm, that's why I was perfect. I I literally knew nothing about wine, and I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. Like I have no problem admitting I don't know anything about anything to this day. Uh, so it just really resonated for me, and and it just it's just written in like it has everything, but it just seems. Your love of words and clarity comes through. It's literally in plain English. I, 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 I can't think of a better way to describe it. Like, it has Sancerre and Chateau. It has everything. Chateau de Pop and Pomerol and left bank, right bank. and But in a way that's not intimidating, that, that makes you like, what are they talking about? Um, just really, and I tell people all the time, they asked me, how'd you learn so much about wine? I'm like, one, um, tasting, and two, I was tasting with this book, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, so once, you know, like, and then finding out, like, it says, okay, so cassis is common in, like, Bordeaux wine, so wh- what's cassis? So you, you go figure out what it is, and I smell cassis, and you put it in my mental Rolodex, but 
it's just so to this day for me and and I love people need to express themselves. I'm glad people are writing books and everything, but like if someone's just coming and just wants to get like the overview of wine, it's just a great place to start. You know, all due credit to the editors uh, of the Four Dummies series because they uh, they told us two. I think two things that I remember specifically. One is to be more literal and and to to recognize to have respect for the um, ignorant, in, in the best sense of the word, the unknowing uh, reader. So I remember once getting a, an editor's query. It was a, on the chapter of Tuscany. And we said the Chianti Classico Zone is located between um, Florence and Siena. And they wrote, what is Siena? And we thought, what? they're in Minneapolis. You know, it's like <laughs> Indianapolis, you know. <laughs> What, what people in India, Indianapolis never heard of Siena? You know, what is this? You know, you know? but w- it, then it, we realized that what they wanted us to say between the cities of, right, right. just to make it more clear, that was one thing. And the other thing I learned from it is that you must always be on the side, on the same side of the fence as the reader is. And you can never be the one who knows talking to a reader who doesn't know. There has to be respect between the author and the reader. Wow. That is profound. I and I agree. No, I I get like you like like you said, it says for dummies, but I never felt like I was a dummy reading the book. I felt like this was the right book for me to pick up and read. And when I finished it, I was not gonna be a a, a quote unquote dummy, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. In, like I said, it's a reference book too. That's the thing mm-hmm. I love about wine. Like this and Jance's Guide to Wine Grapes was like my two books, right? Because mm-hmm. like, what, uh, cause, cause like, what are all these grapes, right? So I'd look up the grape there, go read what you wrote about it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and she's such a brilliant writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was it. Like, uh, like, and to this day, those are by my computer at home. Thank you. Know? you. Um, no, thank you. Uh, there, there would not be, well, there could be a wine podcast, but it would be even more bullshit if I hadn't read this book. <laughs> So you already mentioned that you tra- that it was translated into French, um, but now you've you have you've done books like Italian wine for dummies, mm-hmm. uh, California wine for dummies. Um, how did you approach writing those? Uh, the uh, the publisher would well uh, uh, the first few like Italian and French we proposed to the publisher, but California the publisher came to us. We uh, prefer to write. Uh, on a topic that has a little confusion or mystery to it. Uh, And uh, we don't feel, honestly, for California wine that there's as as much confusion or mystery because with grape varieties, everything being varietal wine and and, and, and California being, you know, our country, uh, a lot of people having been there, I, I don't think that there's as much to untangle for the reader. Um, so it, it's not as much fun, but the Italian and the French, we just, uh, Italian wines are my specialty because that's where I got started. And, uh, I just, um, uh, we just thought that would be just so much fun to write those books and to explain. I mean, there you've got the, well, I guess in Wine for Dummies itself too, but you've got all these wine laws of these countries right. and these hierarchies of regulations to explain, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it, it needs untangling for people. So, what was it like um, writing uh, Italian wines for dummies? Because it's like you said, that's kind of like your it's kind of like your jam. You know, uh, we wanted to be thorough, <laughs> and uh, we uh, and I, I speak Italian, so I would do. Well, I was doing research by that time on the internet, and uh, uh, there wasn't a lot out there, you know, on the internet as there is now. But I would hear about. Um, I, I would discover. I wanted to list every single DOC in every single region, you Oof. know. And so I, I remember once hearing about a DOC in Piedmont, and Piedmont is the region that I visit the most because I have dear friends in the. Um, Barolo area, and uh, I, I I remember hearing about a new DOC in in Piedmont 
I can't remember anymore what it's called, uh, but I had never heard of it before. And so it's like four o'clock in the morning, but 10 o'clock in the morning in Italy, and I am contacting my friend and saying, so there's this new DOC in Piedmont called this. Can you tell me about it? He says, what? Never heard of it. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And and uh, it was it was uh, learning as much as it as it was e- explaining. You know, and uh, you know one of the things that's, that's that's funny when you're when you're writing about wine, and Ed and I would often be working on different chapters at the same time because I would have my chapters, he would have his chapters, and then we would edit each other's to make sure that we maintained a a, a similar voice. Mm-hmm. Not 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 to do that. Not with that in mind, but it was the effect of it, you know? And uh, so he would sometimes be writing about, I don't know, uh, one area, and I'd be writing about another, and this is regardless of whether it was Italian or French or whatever. Um, and he'd say, oh, I really, I really feel like having a, uh, uh, a gavi for, for dinner. You know, let's do, do we have any gavi? Let's have a gavi. I'm saying... Are you kidding? I want to have a Brunello, you know, because I would be writing about Brunello, and he would be he would be editing about Gavi, and and so it was just you know, but but there's something about it that just I guess my point is that it makes your mouth water mm. uh, when you um, uh, when you're writing about the wine. You can't even though the wine's not there in front of you, you you want it. You want to taste it, and and then you want to have it afterwards. Um, yeah. Wow. Um. I just, this question just came to me. It's like, so when was your first visit to Piedmont? And, like, what was that like for you? Because, I, like, what was that like? like when, when did you first go? And, like, what was that like? Well, it was before I met Ed. So it okay. was when I was at the Italian Trade Commission. And I think it was probably 1978. And I was leading a group of um, uh, writers, wine writers, um, as, as the person in charge from the Italian Trade Commission. I was leading a press trip. And uh, it was, oh, no, I actually went in 1975 to a, a, a colleague, a female colleague of mine uh, there, and she and I both went uh, together, and we, st- we I think started in Sicily and worked our way all the way up to, oh, wow. all the way up to Piedmont, and we went to Piedmont then, too. But I remember this visit in 1978 because it was in November, and it was a very, very late harvest for Nebbiolo, and one of the mem- memories that I I don't have a I don't have a, a mind for remembering numbers and vintages are are hard for me. I have to really make an effort to remember vintages. But that was 1978, and it was very late vintage for Nebbiolo, and we're on the small bus and we're going through the backcountry roads of Piedmont, and the bus is going so slowly, <laughs> and we're late. So I go up to the bus driver and I say, so what's going on? And I look out his front window and I see that in front of the bus is a tractor drawn um, a flatbed uh, with grapes in it, um, not like a pickup truck kind of, but a more of a homemade pickup truck. And there's a guy with his legs dangling off the tailgate, if you will, of the, of the, of the tractor bed and is holding up a sign that said that in, ta- in Italian, but it said November 15th, 1978, the end of the Nebbiolo harvest. So I guess these were the last people to bring their uh, grapes in or something. Maybe name. it was nothing official, but I remember that, you know? And everybody says, November 15th? Did it go that late? You know, I said, yes, I. I have it on very good authority that it went to <laughs> <laughs> that it went to November fifteenth. So, it was. It, it, I, I think that the f- first, when when you don't have a deep background of knowledge, you don't have understanding, and then when you go to a region, you absorb, but it doesn't mean as much. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until later. I think it was probably around nineteen eighty three, that I went with enough understanding to realize there was a trade show in Geneva that year. And I went with enough understanding of what's going on for what I was seeing to make sense to me. And what was that like? Because did you flash back to like 78 or like, how were you like, what's it like to kind of know like you've come of age or whatever, you know, like, you know, like, like to realize like, oh, 
<laughs> I'm here. What was that like in 83? You know, uh, uh, on the press trips, it's, it really was very much a, uh, a question of meeting individual producers who would tell you whatever they tell you, either about their region or their, their, their region if they were the head of the consortium or their individual winery or, or uh, you know, whatever, the scrape that they rescued or, or whatever it is that they want to tell you. But the experience was very um, fragmented and individualized. You know, you learn about this experience here, that experience there, and you wouldn't, and you wouldn't have a lot of context. And then um, th that was the, the big difference when all the experiences started uh, to take shape into a, a, a picture, and you realize that you've got the beginning of a real picture going on in your head. Got it, I got it. Um, so you mentioned um, you're a, uh, are you a, a, a Barolo woman or a Barbaresco woman? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Barbaresco costs less, and it's ready to drink sooner. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, just for some people out there, because I, I often get the, uh, mixed up between the, the two. I, I thought I liked Barbaresco because it seemed more uh, feminine. It's a little bit softer. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's easier to drink. You know, I, I like that. But, um, like, um, yeah, just give us, give us a little, a quick mini master class on Barbaresco and, Barbaro and Barola. Well, you know, the Barolo zone is much bigger, so that's why you hear about Barolo okay. much more. Um, they're both 100% from the Nebbiolo grape. Um, Barbaresco is in the same general area, but it's just on the other side of the town of Alba, which is a, just a wonderful little town. And um, it uh, they're both hillside vineyards, but the vineyards in Barbaresco are a little bit steeper. I mean, to my eye, they're steeper. Um, and uh, Barolo has all these different zones. You know, if you're in this part of the region or that part of the region, the soil changes or the aspect can change. Uh, in and I would say that Barbaresco is a little more uniform. Uh, there are only three communes or villages that are part of the Barbaresco zone, and there are, I think, maybe eight or nine that are part of the Barolo zone. Uh, the minimum aging is shorter than the minimum aging before release for Barolo, which in and of itself is a, is a cost difference. The wine is ready to drink sooner. Um, I, uh, uh, I could say I find it more perfumed, but the Nebbiola grape is perfumed. Right, right. So it, it, it always has that, um, it, it when it's ready, I guess that's the thing, you know, when it's when it's a little more developed. And I think actually the perfume in Barolo can be more captivating than the mm. perfume in um, Barbaresco because Barolo can be like strawberries and mint and menthol and eucalyptus and um, tar, always tar. And... Uh, we don't smell too much tar nowadays, but I remember there was a time when Sixth Avenue was always being tarred. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to my students, well, just go out to Sixth Avenue until you find fresh tar, and that's what tar smells like, yeah. you know? Um, and and uh, it, it's a common, Barolo is a combination of, of fruit and flower and and herbal and, and uh, earth and mineral characteristics all together and can be absolutely... Um, I think the range is is greater for Barolo. Of course, I, you know, this is in my experience, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, I've never done a research thesis on it. Uh, but uh, Barbaresco is uh, more limited in range but more available. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And when you it's, you said they're on upsides of uh, Alba, right? Mm -hmm. So I love... Barbera de Alba, and I love Dolcetta de Alba, too. Mm -hmm. Love those wines. Mm -hmm. I think people, you know, I tell people when I'm working retail, I'm like, it's not, Chianti's great. It's a great, great, but, like, people don't know about a Barbera or Dolcetto, these other red, 
varietals from Italy that are just made for food, just kind of yeah. like yeah. Chianti, you know? Well, you know, this one of, one of the things about about Italian wines is that, that they are absolutely made for food, but when you look at it culturally, it's because that's how they are enjoyed. They are enjoyed at home with food. Yeah. And a lot of the food is acidic, like tomatoes. And the wines, therefore, always have good acidity. Um, and it, there are parts of Italy that are very warm, and uh, the grapes can get very ripe. But I, other than in Puglia, which, honestly, I have to say, my, not my favorite wines, mm -hmm. because they get too ripe, and they get too soft and a little too, I don't know, jammy, flabby, you know, mm -hmm. and that's where the Primitivo is, yep. which is Zinfandel, mm -hmm. so it's all very logical, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, except for that, there's always very good definition. This is one of my favorite wine words. I love is this. definition, okay? Um, and, uh, I'm stealing that. <laughs> I like that. And it means that it's, it's not just round. It has to have angles or aspects to it. And another favorite wine word is, is tension. And I got this from Richard Geoffroy, who was for many years the um, Moet, um, the D um, Dom Perignon winemaker. Mm -hmm. And he's a medical doctor, and he's a great thinker, and he's now in Japan making sake. Wow. And uh, he, uh, he, he would put on Dom Perignon tastings for us, and he would talk about the tension in the wine and that a wine can't be a great wine if it doesn't have tension, uh, internal tension. And then that brings you to the act of tasting a wine, which involves thinking about it slowly, clearly, as opposed to drinking a wine, which is like, oh man, that's good. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, I remember once speaking at a um, at an event uh, at a, a wine symposium somewhere, a very small, minor one. Um, but I was theorizing that we wine critics who taste wine uh, and judge competitions and that kind of thing, that we are not truly qualified to judge inexpensive wines. Because when you have an inexpensive wine, um, it is not made for analysis. It is not made, made for careful consideration. It is meant to taste good. So sometimes in my classes now, um, if we have a, uh, okay, so um, this one class on winemaking at level three, and we do a pair of wines blind, and one is from um, Southeast Australia, and you know how that can be very fruity and mm -hmm. juicy, and mm -hmm. you know, it's like, mm, that's good. And, and then a more serious uh, wine from the same grape variety that has definition, um, that has edges to it, that's another way of saying it, you know, or angles or facets. Uh, and they will find fault in the first one. First of all, it's a $10 wine, and they don't know that, okay? <laughs> so then I say to them, here, just, just do this. Pretend you gave it to your next-door neighbor, and you want your next-door neighbor to see if he likes the wine, and he puts it in his mouth, and he goes... And he swallows, and he says, oh, that's good. Because all he's going to get, you know this whole concept of fruit forward? Yep. All he's going to get is whatever is forward in the wine, and he's not going to get whatever follows on in the wine. And so if we sit there and we take such a wine that is made for that consumer and priced for that consumer, who is the intended user mm -hmm. of that wine, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and we say, mm, a little too... Uh, forward, on the palate, lacks length, doesn't have enough acidity and that kind of thing. And it's like, we're not being true to that wine. Wow. We're not being true to what that wine uh, is. Uh. No, I love that. And, and, and what you said, like, that's a common thing with Riesling. Like you said, the average, they're like, oh, it's sweet. I'm like, the way your mouth works, the first thing you're going to taste is the fruit. And if you're not trying to taste wine, you're not you're not gonna get all the minerality and all the racy acidity that going reason you go, oh, tastes like a peach or whatever. They're gonna you're gonna need that one impression. And which is why Riesling is tough for people who don't 
that's why it's such a geeky wine. The Irish people don't like Riesling. But to your point, those 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 eight to t- you know those six to ten dollar bottles of wine from Australia and Chile and they're like California, like California, California. California. <laughs> yeah, at, at least at least I think I'd like to think some of those wines from other places aren't as manipulated. I'd like to think that I don't know. Mm, I'm <clears throat> you know, probably right. Yeah, because um, I I just got like the seven dollar Spanish wine. It's a 2015. It's a Mencia. It's it's freaking fruit bomb. It's delicious. It was seven yeah. bucks a bottle. Well, Mencia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, but yeah, you're right. If someone if someone is mega purpling a wine, that's what that person they know they know that they that's a market. It's a very viable market. And to we had Eric on from the New York Times, uh-huh. and, and we and we talked about his wine school supermarket wines. Like, uh-huh. and people were like, just criticizing him. But the point is that there's wines for everybody, right? And I, I love what you said. Like it's it's we we don't want to be so so snobby. <laughs> that we're, whereas whereas we're gonna break apart a, a bottle of wine that we're not gonna buy anyway. So why why are we bother to pick it apart? You know, and and for every for every body there is a wine. There's yep. a wine for everybody, and for every for every wine there is a body. Right. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, for 10 years, I was the wine critic for the Daily News. And uh, because of the demographics of the Daily News, <laughs> I could God not... I love the Daily News. <laughs> <laughs> I, could not, uh, I could not recommend any wine or really even talk about wines that w- cost more than $15. Yeah. So $15 in, that, in those days was pretty, was pretty generous, actually. Wine, yeah. yeah. But I would start to get samples, coming in samples, pouring and pouring in, and I would, I would taste them blind and, and all this kind of thing. And, and one of the things that was going on in those days, probably still, but I was not, I was paying more attention to it then, was the, the funny labels, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the Godzilla labels or the, mm-hmm. or the, the I, I don't know, you know, the, the labels that were meant to attract females <laughs> or the labels that were meant, I, whatever, you right. know, and they were great fun, great fun, right. you know? Yeah. Um, and you just know that what's inside the bottle is secondary. Totally. You know, it's just about like <laughs> pick up. And, you know, I also think that that I would, if I'm in a restaurant, which is already setting uh, the bar in a particular place, but I will taste a wine, I will drink a wine on any excuse. So if a server comes over and says, you know, hey, there's this wine that we all tasted during our group lunch, and we just flipped over it. Is this and that? And I say, sure, I'll have a glass, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I think you just need an excuse to try it, you Mm -hmm. know? I I don't think that that your your morality or or (laughs) what God is going to say to you when you get to heaven. You drank yellowtail Shiraz. (laughs) 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 Bye-bye. <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's sometimes it's too serious, and and I think, but I do think, and hopefully more people will be more adventurous because so people just I like Merlot. It's people get you know stuck. Mm-hmm. Whereas like that was my thing. Like when I worked in a restaurant, I was like, oh, you know, we just got this, you know, we got this Trousseau Gris. It's from the Fanuki Wood Vineyard. It, you got to try it. And people are like, okay, you know, having people who are willing to try that, you know, or it's to say someone like, oh, you like Pinot Grigio? Well, like, put down that $25 Pinot Grigio and just try this $15 Falangina. It's a nice Italian dry white, you know, and people being willing to do that, and hopefully we get more of that, but um, I just love that whole conversation you just had there because it's, it's, it's true. Like, that wine is not meant to be analyzed like that. It has, it, you know, there there is there is a body for every wine. I love that. That's 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 a that's a quote. That's a T-shirt. There's a body for every wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, with all this stuff with the book and like you know, um, have you like fan mail? Like, to, have you gotten feedback emails from people like about how the book over the years? Over the years, yeah, but I mean, not so much now because yeah. it, it's it's been quite a while since it's yeah. been out. The seventh edition came out, I think, um, two or three years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, mainly what I get is I get these really surprising, like when you said to me, you know, it's like, well, it's 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 the wine book that you learned from. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, really? Um, now, I don't know you well enough to know what you know, but I know that 
you know enough about wine to do what you do. So <laughs> that's and that's it. <laughs> yeah. But I remember once doing uh, for for WSET, I would I would do educator training, which is when you go to a WSET school and you put the the teachers through uh, a training program that's four days long to um, help them become better mm -hmm. uh, WSET teachers. And I remember once uh, there was this, uh, there was this, it was in Miami and it was for a distributor and a number of people who worked for that distributor who taught WCT courses were master sommeliers. And uh, so we had been doing this little um, peer group thing that I was leading with some of them. And I was standing in line for lunch and I was behind this one master sommelier. And I, I said to him, you know, I think you did such a great job in the peer group uh, because I said you you said very encouraging remarks to the others, but you did you were able to point out what they could do to do it better. And I I said apparently you're a really good manager. And he said, well thanks, but he said, but you. And I said, me what me? <laughs> <laughs> he said, wine for dummies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah right. <laughs> you know I, so sometimes it surprises me and and. I, I remember also uh, uh, four or five years after having written it, going around to a trade tasting, all these trade tastings that we used to go to, and you know you turn to the guys behind the table, n not just always guys, but they you would turn to them as the people who knew about that wine and that brand and that producer, and so you would respect them um, for the not at least the specific knowledge they had if they didn't have broader knowledge, but whether they had broader knowledge was almost immaterial. And so there was someone, and I was listening to him talk about the wine and the grape variety and all this kind of thing, and then he said something about Wine for Dummies. He said, it was the first wine book I ever read, and everything I learned I, I knew through Wine for Dummies. And I, I just thought, but you're, t you're telling me now. I'm <laughs> listening to you tell me about this wine, but you learned from me. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just all these improbable little yeah. situations over the years that have been mm. really um, heartwarming, really heartwarming. Yeah, no, um, it, it, yeah, ah. <laughs> it is a great book, and, and, and thank you. Like, what I do, I, I just, like, I lost my copy moving. I moved so much when I was in my 30s, and then, like, a couple of years ago, I was like, I need wine for dummies. It's so actually when I started going back on Instagram, I was like, I need wine for dummies. <laughs> Make sure I'm not talking out my ass. <laughs> you know? Um, I want to give good, I want to give as good information as I can over the interwebs. That's what I would like to do, <clears throat> you know? Because there's a lot of bad information, not just in wine, just, you know, just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Was there a bottle of wine that did it for you? Like that that like you had a bottle of wine and you're like, "Oh, I have to do this." Well, yes, and and it was uh not my first bottle of wine by any sure. stretch. My first bottle of wine was a uh, Matus Rosé. Got to love Matus Rosé. Actually, we talked about that me and uh Bruno, who's a Portuguese, he's from Portugal. He talked mm -hmm. about Matus Rosé. Mm -hmm. From Portugal, dry, dry wine from Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I was well into my um, career at the Italian Trade Commission, and having uh, tasted all sorts of, you know, I mean, Barolas, Barbarescos, all that kind of thing, uh, to the extent that I was g getting enough out of them, which probably was not enough because you have the more you bring, the more you get, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, Brunello di Montalcino was not yet imported into the U.S. Wow. And I was, uh, it was the mid-70s, and I was with my, my first husband, and we w went to Italy together. We were in Florence, and we were in this restaurant, this very nice restaurant in Florence. And um, I looked at the wine list, and I decided that I wanted to order a bottle of Brunello di Montalcino, and the waiter tried to talk me out of it. This happens sometimes in Europe. I remember when Ed and I were together... <laughs> Once being, uh, uh, the waiter tried to talk us out of ordering a bottle of uh, 1975 Krug, which champagne, which was a very tiny vintage, 
and uh, he he said, no, it's too vert, it's too it's, it's too, too green, green. Yeah. Uh, it's not ready yet, you know. And we said, yeah, but we don't know if we're ever going to see it again, so we'll have that <laughs> exactly. bottle, you know. And and then we ordered a second one. <laughs> I, I I was an ugly American ordering a second one, but anyway, in this situation in in uh, Florence, I'd like to be that ugly American <laughs> getting two bottles of five crew. We were like, oh USA. We were oh, like, by the way, it was our honeymoon. <laughs> there you go. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So you got these bottles of. Yeah. Green Krug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, th but but going back into the 70s and, and at this restaurant in um, uh, Florence, and the waiter said, well, why don't you have, you know, he says, you know, our local wine is Chianti. Why don't you have a nice bottle of Chianti? And I said, no. And it, my, my time was not great, but I did my best to say, no, I, I cannot taste Brunello di Montalcino in the United States. I want to taste it here. And it was a good restaurant, and I believe that the bottle, of course, there was no cell phone to, t to snap a picture, you know, or anything <laughs> like that. I think it was a bottle of uh, probably the early 60s, uh, which would have been about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, no, mm, some sometime in the 60s, probably a 10-year-old bottle of uh, Fattoria de Barbie, mm. Brunello di Montalcino. Mm. And I tasted it, and I was floored, and I... I we, we mention this at some point in Wine for Dummies in the, the language that you use to talk about wine, that sometimes wine um, drives you to poetry, but most wines really are prosaic. <laughs> and, and so this was, I just tasted it, I said, it's a rainbow in my mouth, mm -hmm. you know? It's every color, but the delineations between the colors are so um, uh, gradual and so blended that you, you, you can't see where one color ends and the next mm. one begins. And it was, it was just m magical. And I, just rem I, remember, I remember that wine from the words that I used to describe it. So that was my first really great wine that was ready to drink and, and my first Brunello di Montalcino. Wow, wow. That is a great story. <clears throat> like, that's like... I'm just thinking, like, people love Brunello de Montalcino now, and, like, there was a time when it wasn't even imported in the U.S. That's yeah, what, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. like... Well, I think it was about the next year that Banfi took care of that by uh, importing... Um, they didn't yet have their own winery, but they were importing Poggio Alla Mora, I think, which then was a property that they purchased and and turned into a, a very, very fine um, subset of the Castello Banfi mm -hmm, brand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow, wow. So, um, what are you doing these days? You're you're running the uh, you're run, still running the International Wine Center, and mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like business is if you go, well maybe because I'm in the wine vertical. I mean, uh, wine spirits and education trust is 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 going strong. Yes. Um, What's what? What do you got going on? Any new books in the works? What 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 are you working on? No, no. To tell you the truth. Uh, 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 I think this is true for so many people, especially in, in our city, during COVID. I have a friend who says the COVID. I like that. Yeah. During the COVID. The COVID. Yeah. Uh, that that uh, it has it is there has been a lot of time devoted to survival. Yep. Um, yeah. We had to we we shut our doors of our wine classes in um, on March sixteenth. Mm -hmm. And we were not allowed to open our doors to have students in again until October 15th. Wow. So it was eight months. The restaurants were already open and all of that. But trade schools, there's like a big crack, the trade school. Who cares? Who cares about trade schools? So because we're licensed by New York State Department, Department of Education, which puts us in that particular category. And uh, so uh, we had to start developing online courses, which we did. And we're still offering the online courses. And then since January, we've had students back in the classroom, but we're always careful. We're learning. We're learning how eager are students to come back to the classroom. Now, vaccinations is a, is a game changer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're, we're really, really glad about that. But we're still required to keep the classes to 50% capacity, six-foot spacing. And uh, it, it, it is... Uh, <laughs> from a, an economies of scale perspective is is dreadful but we're happy just to see students back in the classroom and we still have the online option for people who want to learn online so we're busy 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 
um, and uh, things are getting better, better, better. Yeah, that's great. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's that's about as far as I can see. It's like I, I can't s almost see beyond my own nose these days, so that's that's where I am. And this is a rare opportunity to come out and take a break. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, well, what excites you most about wine right now? What would you say? You know, uh, I was asked recently about what's the next wine trend, and I almost wasn't, I, I was, this was on paper, and I was not able to answer because I wrote Trends Come and Trends Go, and uh, I, I, I do not particularly like orange wines. I, I, I once had one that was sensational, but more often than not, I find them a little flat and oxidized. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I have had some wonderful natural wines. If you would please define for me what is a natural yeah, that, wine. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, I don't seek natural wines, but I have nothing against natural wines. But to me, it's a... Uh, uh, it's a, it, it's a kind of a non-category. Mm -hmm. I mean, full of some really good wines and full of some wines that are fermenting in the bottle. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm excited to see that rosés have persisted because it wasn't that long ago. I'm sure you remember when uh, there was a rosé season, which was uh, the, the summertime, and rosés would disappear in between. And, yeah. and you know... It's not that we drink wines all year. I do believe in, in seasonality. I'm a consumer, too. And um, I do f feel that in the summertime we want to drink lighter wines. But, uh, you know, we all go through um, phases in our wine drinking. And right now I'm in a red wine phase. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at lighter red wines, uh, leaner red wines. So I'm looking at... Um, you know, something that's very interesting lately that I've been following is Nebbiolo d'Alba. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, no, Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo Lange. Lange. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. Nebbiolo Lange, mm -hmm. which actually has a, a much bigger production area than Nebbiolo d'Alba, and it encompasses the Barolo and the Barbaresco area. And the, I'm starting to understand through tasting how different the styles are. Um, and some Nebbiolo Lange producers make, in effect, and Vietti does this with their Perbacco, um, in effect, a declassified Barolo, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, now, they could put in some wines from um, Barbaresco into it if they're calling it Nebbiolo Lange, but they take the um, Barolo lots that they think are not going to make the cut for their very best wines and their next wine, and they put that into Nebbiolo Lange blend and then blending with elements from Nebbiolo from other parts of the Lange area, such as Barbaresco. And they come up with this wine, which I like very much, and I feel it's, to me, rather like a, a mini Barolo. And then you have Marchese di Gracie, which is a very elegant uh, Barbaresco to begin with. And then they make their Martinenga Nebbiolo Lange from a part of Martinenga vineyard in Barbaresco, could be called Barbaresco if it had enough age, um, but they make it specifically from um, clones of Nebbiolo that they are developing that are meant to be more perfumed and ready to drink, make mm. wines that are ready to drink sooner. So that is a particularly elegant, and it's the opposite end of the spectrum from from Vietti's. And then there's everything in between. And so I'm really fascinated by that. I mean, it's rather complicated for consumers and rather useless for consumers in a way to have this name, Nebbiolo Lange, when it does not have a specific style to it because it, the style is all over the place. But it's fun. It's fun to explore, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I love that. That's really cool. Yeah, I think, and people are kind of doing the same in Burgundy. People are like, like they're they'll have like they have like a, their vineyards right next to Polini, and like so they'll, like they'll declassify some Polini and throw it near Burgundy. So I think there's an exciting thing going on where producers are now um, allowing people to get a taste of the 
the terroir at at a at a, at a entry level price. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but it is like you said, it, it with European wines, as you know. Um, I always tell people if you're in something like if you see a bottle of a wine from like France and it's ten dollars, it says Pinot Noir. That's for Americans. <laughs> 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 they throw the variety, you know. But but like you said, but the fact that they have this this region, but they're still sorting it out. Like like you said, for someone like you who just loves to keep learning and just has that beginner's yeah, mind, yeah. you're like, I'm going to sort through this and it's yeah. fun. But yeah, for while while it's going on, a lot of people are going to be getting to taste more wine. That's it. Yeah. You just get to taste more wine, people. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I also love uh, Argentina. I I uh, was one of the last trips I took before the COVID, and uh, it. It is, uh, oh my goodness, I I went there because I had been there several times before and I had decided that all Argentina Malbecs taste the same. Okay. And so this was a trip with other Masters of Wine sponsored by the Institute of Masters of Wine and I thought if I'm ever going to be disabused of this concept, this is going to be the group that's going to do it for me by seeing their reactions, by listening to them and listening to their questions and visiting the great producers that we do. And uh, I have such admiration for what's happening in Argentina now. Chile, too, but Chile's going about it differently. Um, Argentina, they're getting into micro-terroirs, uh, going up into the Andes, and, and, and little. I fell in love with this area because it, the name is so hard to pronounce. It's Guatayari, <laughs> and uh, it's 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 in it's in the Andes, and that's where the uh, in that area is where the um, uh, Catena white stones and white bones Chardonnay come from. Oh, wow. You know, super expensive yep. hundred hundred dollar Chardonnays mm -hmm. that are really extraordinary um, because the soils are so extraordinary. And and then I went to Cafayate, which is up in the Salta province, so it's way north. And uh, so north, closer to the equator, so it should be a warmer area, but very high altitudes. So uh, some vineyards as high as a thousand meters, and um, the sunshine is very intense, uh, but at a thousand meters, uh, but close to the equator. So there all is there's all this confluences mm. confluence of of uh, of climate factors, and they're growing Malbec there that is is really exciting and of course that's where they grow a lot of torrentes which i'm i like i mean i don't love it but i really like it and i and a lot of it is coming from there so uh, these parts of the world you know it's uh oh i gotta get traveling again i know gotta get my feet on the ground <laughs> oh my god mary mary thank you so much for being here uh i mean like i got like a free we, we you guys getting a Pretty much, well, you get to know about this amazing one, but some master class for free. You know, but you, if you're in New York, you should come take, well, they're online too, so you could take classes. Yes, yes, um, yes. Uh, tell people where they can find you and how they can be a part of what you're doing, Mary. So uh, the website is internationalwinecenter.com, but it's it's true, it's not a, a uh, chatty website. It is strictly a website that lays out all the different options that you have if you want to study wine. Um, I write about wine for uh, once a month for a uh, online publication called Wine Review Online. Um, I have a column there where I take one wine and write 500 to 700 words about that wine that month, which is really a lot of fun. Um, I get I I talk at a high level, but I don't get geeky, so it's very understandable whether you're kind of like getting started or not getting started, and. Uh, also, my um, Instagram handle, where you can meet very interesting people in wine. It's really a fun place to connect, and I don't do it often enough, but it's at M-E-M dot M-W, and Twitter, I'm M-E-M-M-W, and I want to get back into Twitter, but I will tell you that politically for a little while there, Yeah, no, I, I know, because you can do I it. I just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> enough said. <laughs> If, if the politics were bothering you, we know where you stand on that one. <laughs> <laughs> totally understandable. Oh, my God. Thank you. 
One of my, uh, uh, I, uh, kind of an idol, an icon, thank you so much for writing this book and helping to educate so many. And just thank you for your passion for wine and for teaching and words. And thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. So everybody, until the next time, cheers to the Mavericks, the philosophers, the deep thinkers, and to all you wine drinkers, it's your boy MJ. Peace.